Jason, I want to bring you into this. Jason Pride is director of investment strategy over at Glenn Mead. They have $19 billion in assets under management. He was uh, going to join us from the New York Stock Exchange today, but he actually needed to stay closer to clients in Philadelphia. Uh, Jason, that makes sense. I mean, how nervous are your clients at this point, especially when you see all the volatility, not just on a daily basis, but within an hour or half an hour here? Look, I mean, this is this is the way it is when when the markets swing this way. Anytime you have a drop of this magnitude, you know, it almost doesn't matter how much protection uh, a client has or how defensive they position their portfolios. There's always going to be a portion of it that that underperforms if they have any sort of diversified allocation. And and when you have a portion of your portfolio underperform, uh, there is a nervous reaction on the part of all investors. You know, it's it, it's interesting in that uh, you know we've pointed this out before. Uh, the stock market is the only marketplace in which the buyers do not get excited and start jumping up and down when a deal suddenly presents itself. Uh, instead, they tend to react exactly the opposite because, I mean, partly because they're already in and invested in those, in those, uh, in those items. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. <laughs> That's all right. No, so. Talk to me a little bit about this environment, though. I mean, there are some folks out there saying that the valuations are so low. It doesn't mean that they couldn't even go lower at this point, Jason. But, I mean, is it a time to be out there buying? Look, from our perspective, when you, when you look at equity markets, valuations are relatively attractive at this point in time. When you look at fixed income, your most protective markets, valuations there are dear. And it, it, in my mind, it really doesn't even matter what the Fed promises as to where they're going to keep rates. From a long-term perspective, those sort of returns are minuscule and are hard for a longer term investor to, to to find attractive. So when you look at things on a relative basis, we are sitting in an extreme between riskier assets and 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 risk free or or your protected assets. So investors have to be looking at this environment and recognizing that that's coming about because of the uncertainty, because of the volatility. Uh, and and that is the offsetting factor that investors have to balance in this process. But at these sort of valuations, it's hard not to look at it from a long-term perspective and say that you need to own a reasonable allocation to equities at this point. But why, do you know, Jason, if the play here is the U.S. economy is so weak that the Fed's going to have to come up uh, with more quantitative easing, uh, more heroin for the junkie, as people have been putting it, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the confidence be behind uh, the idea that we get as high as we got the first couple times? I mean, at some point... What you're chasing the dragon, it just doesn't work anymore, right? Yeah, and, and I agree with you. We've we've used the analogy of uh, the Federal Reserve's action, monetary policy, as basically a bandage, a band-aid, something that can get you over a hump and and perhaps provide protection and stability in a time of uncertainty. But it is not the long-term solution. If you really think about the long-term solutions that have to come out is the U.S. has, the U.S. government has to get its act together in a more material deficit reduction plan. Four trillion dollar number that, that S&P has tossed out as something that would stabilize the debt level. That would bring about the confidence that, they need, that we need to provide a more reasonable economic recovery at this point. Europe is in a similar position. They have to put forward a true recapitalization of banking system and how to handle the peripheral debt in order to gain the confidence of the market and the economic participants on a longer term basis. Hey, and my question, Jason, for you is, since we did hear from the Fed today, a lot of currency traders expect the dollar weakness to continue. Isn't that alone supportive for gold? And are you buying gold at these levels? We're at 17 and change announced today. So, so you know, first thing, I think this is very interesting what the Fed did. And just to highlight this, because I don't think everybody's talking about it, this decision to keep interest rates low and communicate that out until 2013 is basically a freebie for them. Uh, if you think about it, it doesn't require them to commit capital and expand the, the balance sheet, yet it has a very significant magnitude effect on, on short-term and even long-term rates because you're communicating such a long time frame. Uh, for maintenance of those numbers. I think that's why we saw this this move. As far as gold is concerned, I can understand the thought process uh, uh, for why gold is rallying. You know, gold is a, another proxy for, for money supply and total uh, monetary worth. And obviously, this is a situation that is, that is increasing and providing monetary stimulus and driving up hard assets like that. Having said that, 
You look at $1,800 an ounce and you start comparing that against the, the inflation backdrop that we've seen over the past 30 years, and gold is at a over 100% premium to where it should be on an inflation-adjusted basis. It may stay there for a while. It may go to 2200 But at this point in time, for a longer-term investment, gold is not the right place to be. It's a great protection now. But at these sort of extremes, it's starting to get to be a dangerous way of protecting your portfolio. Hey, Jason, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Jason Pride there. I